thinking that thou wast someone from down below bringing a message bidding me come straightway to King Nicholas. To this speech the other answered not a word, but he pushed the cowl back from his head and showed a knit brow, a hooked nose, and a pair of fierce, restless black eyes, which altogether made Robin think of a hawk as he looked on his face. But beside this there was something about the lines on the stranger's face, and his thin cruel mouth, and the hard glare of his eyes, that made one's flesh creep to look upon. Who art thou, rascal, said he at last, in a loud, harsh voice. Tut, tut, quoth Mary Robin, speak not so sourly, brother. Hast thou fed upon vinegar and nettles this morning that thy speech is so stinging? And thou likest not my words said the other fiercely, thou hadst best be jogging, for I tell thee plainly, my deeds match them. Nay, but I do like thy words, thou sweet, pretty thing quoth Robin, squatting down upon the grass in front of the other. Moreover, I tell thee thy speech is witty and gamesome as any I ever heard in all my life. The other said not a word, but he glared upon Robin with a wicked and baleful look, such as a fierce dog bestows upon a man ere it springs at his throat. Robin returned the gaze with one of wide-eyed innocence not a shadow of a smile twinkling in his eyes or twitching at the corners of his mouth. So they sat staring at one another for a long time, until the stranger broke the silence suddenly. What is thy name, fellow, said he. Now quoth Robin, I am right glad to hear thee speak, for I began to fear the sight of me had stricken thee dumb. As for my name, it may be this or it may be that, but methinks it is more meet for thee to tell me thine, seeing that thou art the greater stranger in these parts. Prithee, tell me, sweet Chuck, why wearest thou that dainty garb upon thy pretty body? At these words the other broke into a short, harsh roar of laughter. By the bones of the demon Odin said he, Thou art the boldest spoken man that ever I have seen in all my life. I know not why I do not smite thee down where thou sittest, for only two days ago I skewered a man over back of Nottingham town for saying not half so much to me as thou hast done. I wear this garb, thou fool, to keep my body warm. Likewise it is near as good as a coat of steel against a common sword thrust. As for my name, I care not who knoweth it. It is Guy of Gisborne, and thou mayst have heard it before. I come from the woodlands over in Herefordshire, upon the lands of the bishop of that ilk. I am an outlaw and get my living by hook and by crook in a manner it boots not now to tell of. Not long since the bishop sent for me, and said that if I would do a certain thing that the sheriff of Nottingham would ask of me, he would get me a free pardon, and give me ten score pounds to boot. So straightway I came to Nottingham town and found my sweet sheriff. And what thinkest thou he wanted of me? Why, forsooth, to come here to Sherwood to hunt up one Robin Hood, also an outlaw, and to take him alive or dead. It seemeth that they have no one here to face that bold fellow, and so sent all the way to Herefordshire, and to me, for thou knowest the old saying, Set a thief to catch a thief. As for the slaying of this fellow, it galleth me not a whit, for I would shed the blood of my own brother for the half of two hundred pounds. To all this Robin listened, 
and as he listened his gorge rose. Well he knew of this guy of Gisborne, and of all the bloody and murderous deeds that he had done in Herefordshire, for his doings were famous throughout all the land. Yet, although he loathed the very presence of the man, he held his peace, for he had an end to serve. Truly quoth he, I have heard of thy gentle doings. Methinks there is no one in all the world that Robin Hood would rather meet than thee. At this guy of Gisborne gave another harsh laugh. Why quoth he, it is a merry thing to think of one stout outlaw like Robin Hood meeting another stout outlaw like Guy of Gisborne. Only in this case it will be an ill happening for Robin Hood, for the day he meets Guy of Gisborne he shall die. But thou gentle, merry spirit quoth Robin, dost thou not think that mayhap this same Robin Hood may be the better man of the two? I know him right well, and many think that he is one of the stoutest men hereabouts. He may be the stoutest of men hereabouts quoth Guy of Gisborne, yet, I tell thee, fellow, this sty of yours is not the wide world. I lay my life upon it I am the better man of the two. He an outlaw, forsooth. Why? I hear that he hath never let blood in all his life, saving when he first came to the forest. Some call him a great archer, Mary, I would not be afraid to stand against him all the days of the year with a bow in my hand. Why, truly, some folk do call him a great archer said Robin Hood, but we of Nottinghamshire are famous hands with the longbow. Even I, though but a simple hand at the craft, would not fear to try a bout with thee. At these words Guy of Gisborne looked upon Robin with wondering eyes, and then gave another roar of laughter till the woods rang. Now quoth he, thou art a bold fellow to talk to me in this way. I like thy spirit in so speaking up to me for few men have dared to do so. Put up a garland, lad, and I will try a bout with thee. Tut, tut, quoth Robin, only babes shoot at garlands hereabouts. I will put up a good Nottingham mark for thee. So saying, he arose, and going to a hazel thicket not far off, he cut a wand about twice the thickness of a man's thumb. From this he peeled the bark, and, sharpening the point, stuck it up in the ground in front of a great oak tree. Thence he measured off fourscore paces, which brought him beside the tree where the other sat. There quoth he, is the kind of mark that Nottingham yeomen shoot at. Now let me see thee split that wand if thou art an archer. Then Guy of Gisborne arose. Now out upon it, cried he. The devil himself could not hit such a mark as that. Mayhap he could and mayhap he could not quoth Merry Robin, but that we shall never know till thou hast shot their eight. At these words Guy of Gisborne looked upon Robin with knit brows, but, as the yeoman still looked innocent of any ill meaning, he bottled his words and strung his bow in silence. Twice he shot, but neither time did he hit the wand, missing it the first time by a span and the second time by a good palm's breadth. Robin laughed and laughed. I see now, quoth he, that the devil himself could not hit that mark. Good fellow, if thou art no better with the broad sword than thou art with the bow and arrow, thou wilt never overcome Robin Hood. At these words Guy of Gisborne glared savagely upon Robin. 
Quoth he, Thou hast a merry tongue, thou villain, but take care that thou makest not too free with it, or I may cut it out from thy throat for thee. Robin Hood strung his bow and took his place with never a word, albeit his heartstrings quivered with anger and loathing. Twice he shot, the first time hitting within an inch of the wand, the second time splitting it fairly in the middle. Then, without giving the other a chance for speech, he flung his bow upon the ground. There, thou bloody villain, cried he fiercely, let that show thee how little thou knowest of manly sports. And now look thy last upon the daylight, for the good earth hath been befooled long enough by thee, thou vile beast. This day, Our Lady willing, thou diest, I am Robin Hood. So saying, he flashed forth his bright sword in the sunlight. For a time Guy of Gisborne stared upon Robin as though bereft of wits but his wonder quickly passed to a wild rage. Art thou indeed Robin Hood, cried he. Now I am glad to meet thee, thou poor wretch. Shrive thyself, for thou wilt have no time for shriving when I am done with thee. So saying, he also drew his sword. And now came the fiercest fight that ever Sherwood saw for each man knew that either he or the other must die, and that no mercy was to be had in this battle. Up and down they fought, till all the sweet green grass was crushed and ground beneath the trampling of their heels. More than once the point of Robin Hood's sword felt the softness of flesh, and presently the ground began to be sprinkled with bright red drops albeit not one of them came from Robin's veins. At last Guy of Gisborne made a fierce and deadly thrust at Robin Hood, from which he leaped back lightly, but in so leaping he caught his heel in a root and fell heavily upon his back. Now, Holy Mary aid me, muttered he, as the other leaped at him, with a grin of rage upon his face. Fiercely Guy of Gisborne stabbed at the other with his great sword, but Robin caught the blade in his naked hand, and, though it cut his palm, he turned the point away so that it plunged deep into the ground close beside him, then, ere a blow could be struck again, he leaped to his feet, with his good sword in his hand. And now despair fell upon Guy of Gisborne's heart in a black cloud, and he looked around him wildly, like a wounded hawk. Seeing that his strength was going from him, Robin leaped forward, and, quick as a flash, struck a backhanded blow beneath the sword arm. Down fell the sword from Guy of Gisborne's grasp and back he staggered at the stroke, and, ere he could regain himself, Robin's sword passed through and through his body. Round he spun upon his heel, and, flinging his hands aloft with a shrill, wild cry, fell prone upon his face upon the green sod. Then Robin Hood wiped his sword and thrust it back into the scabbard, and, Coming to where Guy of Gisborne lay, he stood over him with folded arms, talking to himself the while. This is the first man I have slain since I shot the king's forester in the hot days of my youth. I oft times think bitterly, even yet, of that first life I took, but of this I am as glad as though I had slain a wild boar that laid waste a fair country. Since the sheriff of Nottingham hath sent such a one as this against me, I will put on the fellow's garb and go forth to see whether I may not find his worship, and perchance pay him back some of the debt I owe him upon this score. 
So saying, Robin Hood stripped the hairy garments from off the dead man, and put them on himself, all bloody as they were. Then, strapping the other's sword and dagger around his body and carrying his own in his hand, together with the two bows of you, he drew the cowl of horse's hide over his face, so that none could tell who he was, and set forth from the forest, turning his steps toward the eastward and Nottingham town. As he strode along the country roads, men, women, and children hid away from him, for the terror of Guy of Gisborne's name and of his doings had spread far and near. And now let us see what befell Little John while these things were happening. Little John walked on his way through the forest paths until he had come to the outskirts of the woodlands, where, here and there, fields of barley, corn, or green meadowlands lay smiling in the sun. So he came to the high road and to where a little thatched cottage stood back of a cluster of twisted crab trees, with flowers in front of it. Here he stopped of a sudden, for he thought that he heard the sound of someone in sorrow. He listened, and found that it came from the cottage, so, turning his footsteps thither, he pushed open the wicket and entered the place. There he saw a grey-haired dame sitting beside a cold hearthstone, rocking herself to and fro and weeping bitterly. Now little John had a tender heart for the sorrows of other folk, so, coming to the old woman and patting her kindly upon the shoulder, he spoke comforting words to her, bidding her cheer up and tell him her troubles, for that mayhap he might do something to ease them. At all this the good dame shook her head, but all the same his kind words did soothe her somewhat. So after a while she told him all that bore upon her mind. That that morning she had three as fair, tall sons beside her as one could find in all Nottinghamshire, but that they were now taken from her, and were like to be hanged straightway, that, want having come upon them, her eldest boy had gone out, the night before, into the forest and had slain a hind in the moonlight, that the king's rangers had followed the blood upon the grass until they had come to her cottage, and had there found the deer's meat in the cupboard, that, as neither of the younger sons would betray their brother, the foresters had taken all three away, in spite of the oldest saying that he alone had slain the deer, that, as they went, she had heard the rangers talking among themselves, saying that the sheriff had sworn that he would put a check upon the great slaughter of deer that had been going on of late by hanging the very first rope caught their eight upon the nearest tree, and that they would take the three youths to the king's head inn, near Nottingham town. Where the sheriff was abiding that day, there to await the return of a certain fellow he had sent into Sherwood to seek for Robin Hood. To all this little John listened, shaking his head sadly now and then. Alas quoth he, when the good dame had finished her speech, this is indeed an ill case. But who is this that goeth into Sherwood after Robin Hood, and why doth he go to seek him? But no matter for that now, only that I would that Robin Hood were here to advise us. Nevertheless, no time may be lost in sending for him at this hour, if we would save the lives of thy three sons. Tell me, hast thou any clothes hereabouts that I may put on in place of these of Lincoln Green? Marry. If our stout sheriff catcheth me without disguise, I am like to be run up more quickly than thy sons, let me tell thee, dame.
Then the old woman told him that she had in the house some of the clothes of her good husband, who had died only two years before. These she brought to little John, who, doffing his garb of Lincoln green, put them on in its stead. Then, making a wig and false beard of uncarded wool, he covered his own brown hair and beard, and, putting on a great, tall hat that had belonged to the old peasant, he took his staff in one hand and his bow in the other and set forth with all speed to where the sheriff had taken up his inn. A mile or more from Nottingham town, and not far from the southern borders of Sherwood Forest, stood the cosy inn bearing the sign of the king's head. Here was a great bustle and stir on this bright morning, for the sheriff and a score of his men had come to stop there and await Guy of Gisborne's return from the forest. Great hiss and fuss of cooking was going on in the kitchen, and great rapping and tapping of wine kegs and beer barrels was going on in the cellar. The sheriff sat within, feasting merrily of the best the place afforded, and the sheriff's men sat upon the bench before the door, quaffing ale, or lay beneath the shade of the broad spreading oak trees, talking and jesting and laughing. All around stood the horses of the band, with a great noise of stamping feet and a great switching of tails. To this inn came the king's rangers, driving the widow's three sons before them. The hands of the three youths were tied tightly behind their backs, and a cord from neck to neck fastened them all together. So they were marched to the room where the sheriff sat at meat, and stood trembling before him as he scowled sternly upon them. So quoth he, in a great, loud, angry voice, Ye have been poaching upon the king's dear, have you? Now I will make short work of you this day, for I will hang up all three of you as a farmer would hang up three crows to scare others of the kind from the field. Our fair county of Nottingham hath been too long a breeding place for such naughty knaves as ye are. I have put up with these things for many years, but now I will stamp them out once for all, and with you I will begin. Then one of the poor fellows opened his mouth to speak, but the sheriff roared at him in a loud voice to be silent, and bade the rangers to take them away till he had done his eating and could attend to the matters concerning them. So the three poor youths were marched outside, where they stood with bowed heads and despairing hearts, till after a while the sheriff came forth. Then he called his men about him, and quoth he, These three villains shall be hanged straightway, but not here, lest they breed ill luck to this goodly inn. We will take them over yonder to that belt of woodlands, for I would fain hang them upon the very trees of Sherwood itself, to show those vile outlaws therein what they may expect of me if I ever have the good luck to lay hands upon them. So saying, he mounted his horse, as did his men at arms likewise, and all together they set forth for the belt of woodlands he had spoken of, the poor youths walking in their midst guarded by the rangers. So they came at last to the spot, and here nooses were fastened around the necks of the three, and the ends of the cords flung over the branch of a great oak tree that stood there. Then the three youths fell upon their knees and loudly besought mercy of the sheriff, but the sheriff of Nottingham laughed scornfully. Now quoth he, I would that I had a priest here to shrive you, but, as none is nigh, you must e'en travel your road with all your sins packed upon your backs, 
and trust to Saint Peter to let you in through the gates of paradise like three peddlers into the town. In the meantime, while all this had been going forward, an old man had drawn near and stood leaning on his staff, looking on. His hair and beard were all curly and white, and across his back was a bow of yew that looked much too strong for him to draw. As the sheriff looked around there he ordered his men to string the three youths up to the oak tree, his eyes fell upon this strange old man. Then his worship beckoned to him, saying, Come hither, father, I have a few words to say to thee. So little John, for it was none other than he, came forward, and the sheriff looked upon him, thinking that there was something strangely familiar in the face before him. How, now said he, methinks I have seen thee before. What may thy name be, father? Please your worship said little John, in a cracked voice like that of an old man. My name is Giles Hobble, at your worship's service. Giles Hobble, Giles Hobble muttered the sheriff to himself, turning over the names that he had in his mind to try to find one to fit to this. I remember not thy name said he at last, but it matters not. As thou a mind to earn sixpence this bright morn? A. Eh? Marry quoth little John, for money is not so plenty with me that I should cast sixpence away and I could earn it by an honest turn. What is it your worship would have me do? Why, this said the sheriff. Here are three men that need hanging as badly as any ear I saw. If thou wilt string them up I will pay thee tuppence apiece for them. I like not that my men-at-arms should turn hangman. Wilt thou try thy hand? In sooth said little John, still in the old man's voice, I ha never done such a thing before, but an a sixpence is to be earned so easily I might as well ha it as anybody. But, your worship, are these naughty fellows shrived? Nay said the sheriff, laughing, never a whit, but thou mayst turn thy hand to that also if thou art so minded. But hasten, I prithee, for I would get back to mine in betims. So little John came to where the three youths stood trembling, and, putting his face to the first fellow's cheek as though he were listening to him, he whispered softly into his ear, Stand still, brother, when thou feelest thy bonds cut, but when thou seest me throw my woolen wig and beard from my head and face, cast the noose from thy neck and run for the woodlands. Then he slyly cut the cord that bound the youth's hands, who, upon his part, stood still as though he were yet bound. Then he went to the second fellow, and spoke to him in the same way, and also cut his bonds. This he did to the third likewise, but all so slyly that the sheriff, who sat upon his horse laughing, what not what was being done, nor his men either. Then little John turned to the sheriff. Please your worship said he. Will you give me leave to string my bow? For I would fain help these fellows along the way, when they are swinging, with an arrow beneath the ribs. With all my heart said the sheriff, only, as I said before, make thou haste in thy doings. Little John put the tip of his bow to his instep and strung the weapon so deftly that all wondered to see an old man so strong. Next he drew a good smooth arrow from his quiver and fitted it to the string, then, looking all around to see that the way was clear behind him, 
he suddenly cast away the wool from his head and face, shouting in a mighty voice, Run! Quick as a flash the three youths flung the nooses from their necks and sped across the open to the woodlands as the arrow speeds from the bow. Little John also flew toward the covert like a greyhound, while the sheriff and his men gazed after him all bewildered with the sudden doing. But ere the yeoman had gone far the sheriff roused himself. After him, he roared in a mighty voice, for he knew now who it was with whom he had been talking, and wondered that he had not known him before. Little John heard the sheriff's words, and seeing that he could not hope to reach the woodlands before they would be upon him, he stopped and turned suddenly, holding his bow as though he were about to shoot. Stand back! cried he fiercely. The first man that cometh a foot forward, or toucheth finger to bowstring, dieth. At these words the sheriff's men stood as still as stocks, for they knew right well that little John would be as good as his word, and that to disobey him meant death. In vain the sheriff roared at them, calling them cowards and urging them forward in a body, they would not budge an inch, but stood and watched little John as he moved slowly away toward the forest, keeping his gaze fixed upon them. But when the sheriff saw his enemy thus slipping betwixt his fingers he grew mad with his rage, so that his head swam and he knew not what he did. Then of a sudden he turned his horse's head, and plunging his spurs into its sides he gave a great shout, and, rising in his stirrups, came down upon Little John like the wind. Then Little John raised his deadly bow and drew the grey goose feather to his cheek. But alas for him! For, ere he could lose the shaft, the good bow that had served him so long, split in his hands, and the arrow fell harmless at his feet. Seeing what had happened, the sheriff's men raised a shout, and, following their master, came rushing down upon little John. But the sheriff was ahead of the others, and so caught up with the yeoman before he reached the shelter of the woodlands. Then leaning forward he struck a mighty blow. Little John ducked and the sheriff's sword turned in his hand, but the flat of the blade struck the other upon the head and smote him down, stunned and senseless. Now, I am right glad said the sheriff, when the men came up and found that Little John was not dead, that I have not slain this man in my haste. I would rather lose five hundred pounds than have him die thus instead of hanging, as such a vile thief should do. Go, get some water from yonder fountain, William, and pour it over his head. The man did as he was bidden, and presently little John opened his eyes and looked around him, all dazed and bewildered with the stun of the blow. Then they tied his hands behind him, and lifting him up set him upon the back of one of the horses, with his face to its tail and his feet strapped beneath its belly. So they took him back to the king's head in, laughing and rejoicing as they went along. But in the meantime the widow's three sons had gotten safely away, and were hidden in the woodlands. Once more the sheriff of Nottingham sat within the king's head inn. His heart rejoiced within him, for he had at last done that which he had sought to do for years, taken little John prisoner. Quoth he to himself, This time tomorrow the rogue shall hang upon the gallows tree in front of the great gate of Nottingham town.
and thus shall I make my long score with him even. So saying, he took a deep draught of canary. But it seemed as if the sheriff had swallowed a thought with his wine, for he shook his head and put the cup down hastily. Now he muttered to himself, I would not for a thousand pounds have this fellow slip through my fingers, yet, should his master escape that foul guy of Gisborne, there is no knowing what he may do, for he is the cunningest knave in all the world, this same Robin Hood. Belike I had better not wait until tomorrow to hang the fellow. So saying, he pushed his chair back hastily, and going forth from the inn called his men together. Quoth he, I will wait no longer for the hanging of this rogue, but it shall be done forthwith, and that from the very tree whence he saved those three young villains by stepping betwixt them and the law. So get ye ready straightway. Then once more they sat little John upon the horse, with his face to the tail, and so, one leading the horse whereon he sat and the others riding around him, they went forward to that tree from the branches of which they had thought to hang the poachers. On they went, rattling and jingling along the road till they came to the tree. Here one of the men spake to the sheriff of a sudden. Your worship, cried he, is not yon fellow coming along toward us that same guy of Gisborne whom thou didst send into the forest to seek Robin Hood? At these words the sheriff shaded his eyes and looked eagerly. Why, certes, quoth he, yon fellow is the same. Now, heaven send that he hath slain the master thief as we will presently slay the man. When little John heard this speech he looked up, and straightway his heart crumbled away within him, for not only were the man's garments all covered with blood, but he wore Robin Hood's bugle horn and carried his bow and broadsword. How now, cried the sheriff, when Robin Hood, in Guy of Gisborne's clothes, had come nigh to them. What luck hath befallen thee in the forest? Why, man, thy clothes are all over blood. And thou likest not my clothes, said Robin in a harsh voice like that of Guy of Gisborne, thou mayst shut thine eyes. Marry, the blood upon me is that of the vilest outlaw that ever trod the woodlands and one whom I have slain this day, albeit not without wound to myself. Then out spake little John, for the first time since he had fallen into the sheriff's hands. O thou vile, bloody wretch! I know thee, Guy of Gisborne, for who is there that hath not heard of thee and cursed thee for thy vile deeds of blood and rapine? Is it by such a hand as thine that the gentlest heart that ever beat is stilled in death? Truly, thou art a fit tool for this coward sheriff of Nottingham. Now I die joyfully, nor do I care how I die, for life is naught to me. So spake little John, the salt tears rolling down his brown cheeks. But the sheriff of Nottingham clapped his hands for joy. Now, Guy of Gisborne cried he, if what thou tellest me is true, it will be the best day's doings for thee that ever thou hast done in all thy life. What I have told thee is sooth, and I lie not, said Robin, still in Guy of Gisborne's voice. Look, is not this Robin Hood's sword? And is not this his good bow of you, and is not this his bugle horn? Thinkest thou he would have given them to Guy of Gisborne of his own free will? Then the sheriff laughed aloud for joy. This is a good day, cried he. 
the great outlaw dead and his right hand man in my hands. Ask what thou wilt of me, Guy of Gisborne, and it is thine. Then this I ask of thee said Robin. As I have slain the master I would now kill the man. Give this fellow's life into my hands, Sir Sheriff. Now thou art a fool, cried the Sheriff. Thou mightst have had money enough for a knight's ransom if thou hadst asked for it. I like ill to let this fellow pass from my hands, but as I have promised, thou shalt have him. I thank thee right heartily for thy gift, cried Robin. Take the rope down from the horse, men, and lean him against yonder tree, while I show you how we stick a porker whence I come. At these words some of the sheriff's men shook their heads, for, though they cared not a whit whether little John were hanged or not, they hated to see him butchered in cold blood. But the sheriff called to them in a loud voice, ordering them to take the yeoman down from the horse and lean him against the tree, as the other bad. While they were doing this Robin Hood strung both his bow and that of Guy of Gisborne, albeit none of them took notice of his doing so. Then, when little John stood against the tree, he drew Guy of Gisborne's sharp, double-edged dagger. Fall back! Fall back, cried he. Would ye crowd so on my pleasure, ye unmannerly knaves? Back, I say. Father yet. So they crowded back, as he ordered, many of them turning their faces away, that they might not see what was about to happen. Come, cried little John. Here is my breast. It is meet that the same hand that slew my dear master should butcher me also. I know thee, Guy of Gisborne. Peace, little John, said Robin in a low voice. Twice thou hast said thou knowest me, and yet thou knowest me not at all. Couldst thou not tell me beneath this wild beast's hide? Yonder. Just in front of thee, lie my bow and arrows, likewise my broad sword. Take them when I cut thy bonds. Now. Get them quickly. So saying, he cut the bonds, and little John, quick as a wink, leaped forward and caught up the bow and arrows and the broad sword. At the same time Robin Hood threw back the cowl of horse's hide from his face and bent Guy of Gisborne's bow, with a keen, barbed arrow fitted to the string. Stand back, cried he sternly. The first man that toucheth finger to bowstring dieth. I have slain thy man, Sheriff, take heed that it is not thy turn next. Then, seeing that little John had armed himself, he clapped his bugle horn to his lips and blew three blasts both loud and shrill. Now when the sheriff of Nottingham saw whose face it was beneath Guy of Gisborne's hood, and when he heard those bugle notes ring in his ear, he felt as if his hour had come. Robin Hood, roared he and without another word he wheeled his horse in the road and went off in a cloud of dust. The sheriff's men, seeing their master thus fleeing for his life, thought that it was not their business to tarry longer, so, clapping spurs to their horses, they also dashed away after him. But though the sheriff of Nottingham went fast, he could not outstrip a clothyard arrow. Little John twanged his bowstring with a shout, and when the sheriff dashed in through the gates of Nottingham Town at full speed, 
a grey goose shaft stuck out behind him like a molting sparrow with one feather in its tail. For a month afterward the poor sheriff could sit upon naught but the softest cushions that could be gotten for him. Thus the sheriff and a score of men ran away from Robin Hood and Little John, so that when Will Stutely and a dozen or more of stout yeomen burst from out the covert, they saw naught of their master's enemies, for the sheriff and his men were scurrying away in the distance, hidden within a cloud of dust like a little thunderstorm. Then they all went back into the forest once more where they found the widow's three sons, who ran to little John and kissed his hands. But it would not do for them to roam the forest at large any more, so they promised that, after they had gone and told their mother of their escape, they would come that night to the greenwood tree, and thenceforth become men of the band. King Richard comes to Sherwood Forest not more than two months had passed and gone since these stirring adventures befell Robin Hood and Little John, when all Nottinghamshire was a mighty stir and tumult, for King Richard of the Lion's Heart was making a royal progress through Merry England, and everyone expected him to come to Nottingham Town in his journeying. Messengers went riding back and forth between the sheriff and the king, until at last the time was fixed upon when his majesty was to stop in Nottingham, as the guest of his worship. And now came more bustle than ever, a great running hither and thither, a rapping of hammers and a babble of voices sounded everywhere through the place for the folk were building great arches across the streets, beneath which the king was to pass, and were draping these arches with silken banners and streamers of many colours. Great hubbub was going on in the guild hall of the town, also, for here a grand banquet was to be given to the king and the nobles of his train and the best master carpenters were busy building a throne where the king and the sheriff were to sit at the head of the table, side by side. It seemed to many of the good folk of the place as if the day that should bring the king into the town would never come, but all the same it did come in its own season, and bright shone the sun down into the stony streets which were all alive with a restless sea of people. On either side of the way great crowds of town and country folk stood packed as close together as dried herring in a box, so that the sheriff's men, halberds in hands, could hardly press them back to leave space for the king's riding. Take care whom thou pushest against, cried a great, burly friar to one of these men. Wouldst thou dig thine elbows into me, sirrah? By Our Lady of the Fountain, and thou dost not treat me with more deference I will crack thy knave's pate for thee, even though thou be one of the mighty sheriff's men. At this a great shout of laughter arose from a number of tall yeomen in Lincoln Green that were scattered through the crowd thereabouts, but one that seemed of more authority than the others nudged the holy man with his elbow. Peace, Tuck said he, didst thou not promise me, ere thou camest here, that thou wouldst put a check upon thy tongue? Eh, Mary grumbled the other but I did not think to have a hard-footed knave trample all over my poor toes as though they were no more than so many acorns in the forest. But of a sudden all this bickering ceased, for a clear sound of many bugle horns came winding down the street. Then all the people craned their necks and gazed in the direction whence the sound came and the crowding and the pushing and the swaying grew greater than ever. And now a gallant array of men came gleaming into sight, 
and the cheering of the people ran down the crowd as the fire runs in dry grass. Eight and twenty heralds in velvet and cloth of gold came riding forward. Over their heads fluttered a cloud of snow-white feathers, and each herald bore in his hand a long silver trumpet, which he blew musically. From each trumpet hung a heavy banner of velvet and cloth of gold, with the royal arms of England emblazoned thereon. After these came riding five score noble knights, two by two, all fully armed, saving that their heads were uncovered. In their hands they bore tall lances, from the tops of which fluttered pennons of many colours and devices. By the side of each knight walked a page clad in rich clothes of silk and velvet, and each page bore in his hands his master's helmet, from which waved long, floating plumes of feathers. Never had Nottingham seen a fairer sight than those five score noble knights, from whose armour the sun blazed in dazzling light as they came riding on their great war horses with clashing of arms and jingling of chains. Behind the knights came the barons and the nobles of the mid-country, in robes of silk and cloth of gold, with golden chains about their necks and jewels at their girdles. Behind these again came a great array of men-at-arms, with spears and halberds in their hands, and, in the midst of these, two riders side by side. One of the horsemen was the sheriff of Nottingham in his robes of office. The other, who was a head taller than the sheriff, was clad in a rich but simple garb, with a broad, heavy chain about his neck. His hair and beard were like threads of gold, and his eyes were as blue as the summer sky. As he rode along he bowed to the right hand and the left, and a mighty roar of voices followed him as he passed, for this was King Richard. Then, above all the tumult and the shouting a great voice was heard roaring, Heaven, its saints bless thee, our gracious King Richard. And likewise our Lady of the Fountain, bless thee. Then King Richard, looking toward the spot whence the sound came, saw a tall, burly, strapping priest standing in front of all the crowd with his legs wide apart as he backed against those behind. By my soul, Sheriff said the king, laughing, ye have the tallest priests in Nottinghamshire that e'er I saw in all my life. If heaven never answered prayers because of deafness, methinks I would nevertheless have blessings bestowed upon me, for that man yonder would make the great stone image of Saint Peter rub its ears and hearken unto him. I would that I had an army of such as he. To this the sheriff answered never a word, but all the blood left his cheeks and he caught at the pommel of his saddle to keep himself from falling, for he also saw the fellow that so shouted, and knew him to be Friar Tuck, and, moreover, behind Friar Tuck he saw the faces of Robin Hood and Little John and Will Scarlet and Will Stutely and Alan Adale and others of the band. How now said the king hastily, art thou ill, sheriff? that thou growest so white. Nay, your majesty said the sheriff, it was naught but a sudden pain that will soon pass by. Thus he spake, for he was ashamed that the king should know that Robin Hood feared him so little that he thus dared to come within the very gates of Nottingham Town. Thus rode the king into Nottingham town on that bright afternoon in the early fall season, and none rejoiced more than Robin Hood and his merry men to see him come so royally unto his own. Eventide had come, 
the great feast in the guild hall at Nottingham Town was done, and the wine passed freely. A thousand waxen lights gleamed along the board, at which sat lord and noble and knight and squire in goodly array. At the head of the table, upon a throne all hung with cloth of gold, sat King Richard with the sheriff of Nottingham beside him. Quoth the king to the sheriff, laughing as he spoke, I have heard much spoken concerning the doings of certain fellows hereabouts, one Robin Hood and his band, who are outlaws and abide in Sherwood Forest. Canst thou not tell me somewhat of them, Sir Sheriff? For I hear that thou hast had dealings with them more than once. At these words the Sheriff of Nottingham looked down gloomily, and the Bishop of Hereford, who was present, gnawed his nether lip. Quoth the Sheriff, I can tell your Majesty but little concerning the doings of those naughty fellows, saving that they are the boldest lawbreakers in all the land. Then up spake young Sir Henry of the Lee a great favourite with the king, under whom he had fought in Palestine. May it please your majesty, said he, when I was away in Palestine I heard of times from my father, and in most cases I heard of this very fellow, Robin Hood. If your majesty would like I will tell you a certain adventure of this outlaw. Then the king laughingly bade him tell his tale, whereupon he told how Robin Hood had aided Sir Richard of the Lee with money that he had borrowed from the Bishop of Hereford. Again and again the king and those present roared with laughter, while the poor bishop waxed cherry red in the face with vexation, for the matter was a sore thing with him. When Sir Henry of the Lee was done, Others of those present, seeing how the king enjoyed this merry tale, told other tales concerning Robin and his merry men. By the hilt of my sword said stout King Richard, this is as bold and merry a knave as ever I heard tell of. Marry, I must take this matter in hand and do what thou couldst not do, Sheriff, to wit clear the forest of him and his band. That night the king sat in the place that was set apart for his lodging while in Nottingham town. With him were young Sir Henry of the Lee and two other knights and three barons of Nottinghamshire, but the king's mind still dwelled upon Robin Hood. Now quoth he, I would freely give a hundred pounds to meet this roguish fellow, Robin Hood, and to see somewhat of his doings in Sherwood Forest. Then up spake Sir Hubert of Gingham, laughing, If your majesty hath such a desire upon you it is not so hard to satisfy. If your majesty is willing to lose one hundred pounds, I will engage to cause you not only to meet this fellow, but to feast with him in Sherwood. Marry, Sir Hubert quoth the king, this pleaseth me well. But how wilt thou cause me to meet Robin Hood? Why, thus said Sir Hubert, let your majesty and us here present put on the robes of seven of the Order of Black Friars and let your majesty hang a purse of one hundred pounds beneath your gown, then let us undertake to ride from here to Mansfield town tomorrow, and, without I am much mistaken, we will both meet with Robin Hood and dine with him before the day be past. I like thy plan, Sir Hubert quoth the king merrily, and tomorrow we will try it and see whether there be virtue in it. So it happened that when early the next morning the sheriff came to where his liege lord was abiding, to pay his duty to him, the king told him what they had talked of the night before, 
and what merry adventure they were set upon undertaking that morning. But when the sheriff heard this he smote his forehead with his fist. Alas, said he, what evil counsel is this that hath been given thee? O oh my gracious lord and king, you know not what you do. This villain that you thus go to seek hath no reverence either for king or king's laws. But did I not hear aright when I was told that this Robin Hood hath shed no blood since he was outlawed, saving only that of that vile guy of Gisborne, for whose death all honest men should thank him? Yet, yeah, your majesty said the sheriff, you have heard aright. Nevertheless, then quoth the king, breaking in on the sheriff's speech, what have I to fear in meeting him, having done him no harm? Truly, there is no danger in this. But mayhap thou wilt go with us, Sir Sheriff. Nay quoth the sheriff hastily, heaven forbid. But now seven habits such as black friars wear were brought, and the king and those about him having clad themselves therein, and his majesty having hung a purse with a hundred golden pounds in it beneath his robes, they all went forth and mounted the mules that had been brought to the door for them. Then the king bade the sheriff be silent as to their doings, and so they set forth upon their way. Onward they travelled, laughing and jesting, until they passed through the open country, between bare harvest fields whence the harvest had been gathered home, through scattered glades that began to thicken as they went farther along, till they came within the heavy shade of the forest itself. They travelled in the forest for several miles without meeting anyone such as they sought, until they had come to that part of the road that lay nearest to Newstead Abbey. By the holy Saint Martin quoth the king, I would that I had a better head for remembering things of great need. Here have we come away and brought never so much as a drop of anything to drink with us. Now I would give half a hundred pounds for somewhat to quench my thirst withal. No sooner had the king so spoken, then out from the covert at the roadside stepped a tall fellow with yellow beard and hair and a pair of merry blue eyes. Truly, holy brother said he, laying his hand upon the king's bridal rein, it were an unchristian thing to not give fitting answer to so fair a bargain. We keep an inn hereabouts and for fifty pounds we will not only give thee a good draught of wine, but will give thee as noble a feast as ever thou didst tickle thy gullet withal. So saying, he put his fingers to his lips and blew a shrill whistle. Then straightway the bushes and branches on either side of the road swayed and crackled, and threescore broad-shouldered yeomen in Lincoln Green burst out of the covert. How now, fellow quoth the king, who art thou, thou naughty rogue? Hast thou no regard for such holy men as we are? Not a whit quoth merry Robin Hood, for the fellow was he, for in sooth all the holiness belonging to rich friars, such as ye are, one could drop into a thimble and the good whiff would never feel it with the tip of her finger. As for my name, it is Robin Hood, and thou mayst have heard it before. Now out upon thee, quoth King Richard. Thou art a bold and naughty fellow and a lawless one withal, as I have often heard tell. Now, prithee, let me and these brethren of mine, travel forward in peace and quietness. It may not be said Robin, for it would look but ill of us to let such holy men travel onward with empty stomachs. 
but I doubt not that thou hast a fat purse to pay thy score at our inn since thou offerest freely so much for a poor draught of wine. Show me thy purse, reverend brother, or I may perchance have to strip thy robes from thee to search for it myself. Nay, use no force said the king sternly. Here is my purse, but lay not thy lawless hands upon our person. Hut, tut quoth merry Robin, what proud words are these? Art thou the king of England, to talk so to me? Here, Will, take this purse and see what there is within. Will Scarlet took the purse and counted out the money. Then Robin bade him keep fifty pounds for themselves, and put fifty back into the purse. This he handed to the king. Here, brother quoth he, take this half of thy money, and thank Saint Martin, on whom thou didst call before, that thou hast fallen into the hands of such gentle rogues that they will not strip thee bare, as they might do. But wilt thou not put back thy cowl? For I would fain see thy face. Nay, said the king, drawing back, I may not put back my cowl, for we seven have vowed that we will not show our faces for four and twenty hours. Then keep them covered in peace, said Robin, and far be it from me to make you break your vows. So he called seven of his yeomen and bade them each one take a mule by the bridle, then, turning their faces toward the depths of the woodlands, they journeyed onward until they came to the open glade and the greenwood tree. Little John, with three score yeomen at his heels, had also gone forth that morning to wait along the roads and bring a rich guest to Sherwood Glade if such might be his luck, for many with fat purses must travel the roads at this time, when such great doings were going on in Nottinghamshire, but though little John and so many others were gone, Friar Tuck and Twiscore or more stout yeomen were seated or lying around beneath the great tree, and when Robin and the others came they leaped to their feet to meet him. By my soul quoth Merry King Richard, when he had gotten down from his mule and stood looking about him, thou hast in very truth a fine lot of young men about thee, Robin. Methinks King Richard himself would be glad of such a bodyguard. These are not all of my fellows, said Robin proudly for three score more of them are away on business with my good right-hand man, Little John. But, as for King Richard, I tell thee, brother, there is not a man of us all but would pour out our blood like water for him. Ye churchmen cannot rightly understand our king, but we yeomen love him right loyally for the sake of his brave doings which are so like our own. But now Friar Tuck came bustling up. Gi ye good den, brothers said he. I am right glad to welcome some of my cloth in this naughty place. Truly. Methinks these rogues of outlaws would stand but an ill chance were it not for the prayers of Holy Tuck, who laboreth so hard for their well-being. Here he winked one eye slyly and stuck his tongue into his cheek. Who art thou, mad priest, said the king in a serious voice, albeit he smiled beneath his cowl. At this Friar Tuck looked all around with a slow gaze. Look you now, quoth he, never let me hear you say again that I am no patient man. Here is a knave of a friar calleth me a mad priest, and yet I smite him not. My name is Friar Tuck, fellow, the holy Friar Tuck. There, Tuck said Robin. 
thouest said enow. Prithee, cease thy talk and bring some wine. These reverend men are athirst, and sin they have paid so richly for their score they must e'en have the best. Friar Tuck bridled at being so checked in his speech, nevertheless he went straightway to do Robin's bidding, so presently a great crock was brought, and wine was poured out for all the guests and for Robin Hood. Then Robin held his cup aloft. Stay, cried he. Tarry in your drinking till I give you a pledge. Here is to good King Richard of great renown, and may all enemies to him be confounded. Then all drank the king's health, even the king himself. Methinks, good fellow said he, thou hast drunk to thine own confusion. Never a whit quoth merry Robin, for I tell thee that we of Sherwood are more loyal to our lord the king than those of thine order. We would give up our lives for his benefiting, while ye are content to lie snug in your abbeys and priories let reign who will. At this the king laughed. Quoth he, Perhaps King Richard's welfare is more to me than thou wottest of, fellow. But enough of that matter. We have paid well for our fare. So canst thou not show us some merry entertainment? I have oft heard that ye are wondrous archers, wilt thou not show us somewhat of your skill? With all my heart, said Robin, we are always pleased to show our guests all the sport that is to be seen. As Gaffer Swanthold saith, Tease a hard heart that will not give a caged starling of the best, and caged starlings ye are with us. Ho, lads! Set up a garland at the end of the glade. Then, as the yeomen ran to do their master's bidding, Tuck turned to one of the mock friars. Hearest thou our master, quoth he, with a sly wink. Whenever he cometh across some poor piece of wit he straightway layeth it on the shoulders of this gaffer Swanthold, whoever he may be, so that the poor goodman goeth travelling about with all the odds and ends and tags and rags of our master's brain packed on his back. Thus spake Friar Tuck, but in a low voice so that Robin could not hear him for he felt somewhat nettled at Robin's cutting his talk so short. In the meantime the mark at which they were to shoot was set up at six score paces distance. It was a garland of leaves and flowers two spans in width, which same was hung upon a stake in front of a broad tree trunk. There quoth Robin, yon is a fair mark, lads. Each of you shoot three arrows there eight, and if any fellow misseth by so much as one arrow, he shall have a buffet of Will Scarlet's fist. Hearken to him, quoth Friar Tuck. Why, master, thou dost bestow buffet from thy strapping nephew as though they were love taps from some bouncing lass. I warrant thou art safe to hit the garland thyself, or thou wouldst not be so free of his cuffing. First David of Doncaster shot, and lodged all three of his arrows within the garland. Well done, David, cried Robin, thou hast saved thine ears from a warming this day. Next Midge, the miller, shot, and he, also lodged his arrows in the garland. Then followed what, the tinker, but alas for him. For one of his shafts missed the mark by the breadth of two fingers. Come hither, fellow said Will Scarlet, in his soft, gentle voice, I owe thee somewhat that I would pay forthwith. Then what, the tinker, 
came forward and stood in front of Will Scarlet, screwing up his face and shutting his eyes tightly, as though he already felt his ears ringing with the buffet. Will Scarlet rolled up his sleeve, and, standing on tiptoe to give the greater swing to his arm, he struck with might and main. Woof! came his palm against the tinker's head, and down went stout Watt to the grass, heels overhead, as the wooden image at the fair goes down when the skillful player throws a cudgel at it. Then, as the tinker sat up upon the grass, rubbing his ear and winking and blinking at the bright stars that danced before his eyes, the yeoman roared with mirth till the forest rang. As for King Richard, he laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. Thus the band shot, each in turn, some getting off scot-free, and some winning a buffet that always sent them to the grass. And now, last of all, Robin took his place, and all was hushed as he shot. The first shaft he shot split a piece from the stake on which the garland was hung, the second lodged within an inch of the other. By my halidom said King Richard to himself, I would give a thousand pounds for this fellow to be one of my guard. And now, for the third time Robin shot, but, alas for him. The arrow was ill-feathered, and... Wavering to one side, it smote an inch outside the garland. At this a great roar went up, those of the yeomen who sat upon the grass rolling over and over and shouting with laughter, for never before had they seen their master so miss his mark, but Robin flung his bow upon the ground with vexation. Now, out upon it, cried he. That shaft had an ill feather to it, for I felt it as it left my fingers. Give me a clean arrow, and I will engage to split the wand with it. At these words the yeoman laughed louder than ever. Nay, good uncle said Will Scarlet in his soft, sweet voice, thou'st had thy fair chance and dost missed thy name out and out. I swear the arrow was as good as any that hath been loosed this day. Come hither, I owe thee somewhat, and would fain pay it. Go, good master roared Friar Tuck, and may my blessing go with thee. Thou'st bestowed these love taps of Will Scarlet's with great freedom. It were pity an thou gottest not thine own share. It may not be said Merry Robin. I am king here, and no subject may raise hand against the king. But even our great King Richard may yield to the Holy Pope without shame, and even take a tap from him by way of penance, therefore I will yield myself to this holy friar, who seemeth to be one in authority and will take my punishment from him. Thus saying, he turned to the king, I prithee, brother, wilt thou take my punishing into thy holy hands? With all my heart quoth Mary King Richard, rising from where he was sitting. I owe thee somewhat for having lifted a heavy weight of fifty pounds from my purse. So make room for him on the green, lads. And thou makest me tumble, quoth Robin, I will freely give thee back thy fifty pounds, but I tell thee, brother, if thou makest me not feel grass all along my back, I will take every farthing thou'st for thy boastful speech. So be it said the king, I am willing to venture it. Thereupon he rolled up his sleeve and showed an arm that made the yeoman stare. But Robin, with his feet wide apart, stood firmly planted, waiting the other, smiling. 
Then the king swung back his arm, and, balancing himself a moment, he delivered a buffet at Robin that fell like a thunderbolt. Down went Robin headlong upon the grass, for the stroke would have felled a stone wall. Then how the yeomen shouted with laughter till their sides ached, for never had they seen such a buffet given in all their lives. As for Robin, he presently sat up and looked all around him, as though he had dropped from a cloud and had lit in a place he had never seen before. After a while, still gazing about him at his laughing yeoman, he put his fingertips softly to his ear and felt all around it tenderly. Will Scarlet said he, count this fellow out his fifty pounds, I want nothing more either of his money or of him. A murrain sees him and his buffeting. I would that I had taken my dues from thee for I verily believe he hath deafened mine ear from ever hearing again. Then, while gusts of laughter still broke from the band, Will Scarlet counted out the fifty pounds, and the king dropped it back into his purse again. I give thee thanks, fellow said he, and if ever thou shouldst wish for another box of the ear to match the one thou hast, Come to me and I will fit thee with it for naught. So spake the merry king, but, even as he ended, there came suddenly the sound of many voices, and out from the covert burst Little John and three score men, with Sir Richard of the Lee in the midst. Across the glade they came running, and, as they came, Sir Richard shouted to Robin, Make haste, dear friend, gather thy band together and come with me. King Richard left Nottingham town this very morning, and cometh to seek thee in the woodlands. I know not how he cometh, for it was but a rumour of this that reached me, nevertheless, I know that it is the truth. Therefore hasten with all thy men and come to Castle Lee, for there thou mayst lie hidden till thy present danger passeth. Who are these strangers that thou hast with thee? Why quoth Mary Robin, rising from the grass, these are certain gentle guests that came with us from the high road over by Newstead Abbey. I know not their names but I have become right well acquaint with this lusty rogue's palm this morning. Marry, the pleasure of this acquaintance hath dust me a deaf ear and fifty pounds to boot. Sir Richard looked keenly at the tall friar, who, drawing himself up to his full height, looked fixedly back at the knight. Then of a sudden Sir Richard's cheeks grew pale for he knew who it was that he looked upon. Quickly he leaped from off his horse's back and flung himself upon his knees before the other. At this, the king, seeing that Sir Richard knew him, threw back his cowl, and all the yeomen saw his face and knew him also, for there was not one of them but had been in the crowd in the good town of Nottingham and had seen him riding side by side with the sheriff. Down they fell upon their knees, nor could they say a word. Then the king looked all around right grimly, and, last of all, his glance came back and rested again upon Sir Richard of the Lee. How is this, Sir Richard, said he sternly. How darest thou step between me and these fellows? And how darest thou offer thy knightly castle of the Lee for a refuge to them? Wilt thou make it a hiding place for the most renowned outlaws in England? Then Sir Richard of the Lee raised his eyes to the king's face. Far be it from me, said he to do aught that could bring your majesty's anger upon me. 
Yet, sooner would I face your majesty's wrath than suffer aught of harm that I could stay to fall upon Robin Hood and his band, for to the my own life, honour, everything. Should I, then, desert him in his hour of need? Ere the knight had done speaking, one of the mock friars that stood near the king came forward and knelt beside Sir Richard, and throwing back his cowl showed the face of young Sir Henry of the Lee. Then Sir Henry grasped his father's hand and said, Here kneels one who hath served thee well, King Richard, and, as thou knowest, hath stepped between thee and death in Palestine. Yet do I abide by my dear father, and here I say also, that I would freely give shelter to this noble outlaw, Robin Hood, even though it brought thy wrath upon me, for my father's honour and my father's welfare are as dear to me as mine own. King Richard looked from one to the other of the kneeling knights and at last the frown faded from his brow and a smile twitched at the corners of his lips. Marry, Sir Richard quoth the king, thou art a bold-spoken knight, and thy freedom of speech weigheth not heavily against thee with me. This young son of thine taketh after his sire both in boldness of speech and of deed, for, as he saith, he stepped one time betwixt me and death, wherefore I would pardon thee for his sake even if thou hadst done more than thou hast. Rise all of you, for ye shall suffer no harm through me this day, for it were pity that a merry time should end in a manner as to mar its joyousness. Then all arose and the king beckoned Robin Hood to come to him. How now, quoth he, is thine ear still too deaf to hear me speak? Mine ears would be deafened in death ere they would cease to hear your majesty's voice, said Robin. As for the blow that your majesty struck me, I would say that though my sins are haply many, methinks they have been paid up in full thereby. Thinkest thou so? said the king with somewhat of sternness in his voice. Now I tell thee that but for three things, to wit, my mercifulness, my love for a stout woodsman, and the loyalty thou hast avowed for me, thine ears, mayhap, might have been more tightly closed than ever a buffet from me could have shut them. Talk not lightly of thy sins, good Robin. But come, look up. Thy danger is past, for hereby I give thee and all thy band free pardon. But, in sooth, I cannot let you roam the forest as ye have done in the past, therefore I will take thee at thy word, when thou didst say thou wouldst give thy service to me, and thou shalt go back to London with me. We will take that bold knave Little John also, and likewise thy cousin, Will Scarlet, and thy minstrel, Alan a Dale. As for the rest of thy band, we will take their names and have them duly recorded as royal rangers, for methinks it were wiser to have them changed to law-abiding caretakers of our dear in Sherwood than to leave them to run at large as outlawed slayers thereof. But now get a feast ready, I would see how ye live in the woodlands. So Robin bade his men make ready a grand feast. Straightway great fires were kindled and burned brightly, at which savoury things roasted sweetly. While this was going forward, the king bade Robin call Alan a Dale, for he would hear him sing. So word was passed for Alan, and presently he came, bringing his harp. Mary said King Richard, if thy singing match thy looks it is fair enough. Prithee, strike up a ditty and let us have a taste of thy skill. Then Alan touched his harp lightly, 
and all words were hushed while he sang thus, Oh, where hast thou been, my daughter? Oh, where hast thou been this day, daughter, my daughter? Oh, I have been to the river's side, where the waters lie all grey and wide, and the grey sky broods o'er the leaden tide, and the shrill wind sighs a straining. What sawest thou there, my daughter? What sawest thou there this day, daughter, my daughter? Oh, I saw a boat come drifting nigh, where the quivering rushes hiss and sigh, and the water suffs as it gurgles by, and the shrill wind sighs a straining. What sailed in the boat, my daughter? What sailed in the boat this day, daughter, my daughter? Oh, there was one all clad in white, and about his face hung a pallid light, and his eyes gleamed sharp like the stars at night, and the shrill wind sighed a straining. And what said he, my daughter? What said he to thee this day, daughter, my daughter? Oh, said he naught, but did he this, thrice on my lips did he press a kiss, and my heart strings shrunk with an awful bliss, and the shrill wind sighed a straining. Why growest thou so cold, my daughter? Why growest thou so cold and white, daughter, my daughter? Oh, never a word the daughter said, but she sat all straight with a drooping head, for her heart was stilled and her face was dead and the shrill wind sighed a straining. All listened in silence, and when Alan a Dale had done King Richard heaved a sigh. By the breath of my body, Alan quoth he, thou hast such a wondrous sweet voice that it strangely moves my heart. But what doleful ditty is this for the lips of a stout yeoman? I would rather hear thee sing a song of love and battle than a sad thing like that. Moreover, I understand it not, what meanest thou by the words? I know not, your majesty said Alan, shaking his head, for oft times I sing that which I do not clearly understand mine own self. Well, well quoth the king, let it pass. Only I tell thee this, Alan, thou shouldst turn thy songs to such matters as I spoke of, to wit, love or, for in sooth thou hast a